A small percentage of them are native and actually know the history and the debate that's going on right now in this area and genuinely want what's good for the native people. And then you have a large percentage who are basically anarchists. They're uh, coming from Kitchener, Toronto, uh, Brantford, and they're only coming here to cause trouble. It's unfortunate. Uh, no, we got your David Menzies for Rebel News here in Caledonia. And folks, before I get to our story today, if you can, please go to journalistdefensefund.com. If you're able to, make a donation. We sometimes have, like tonight, security costs to pay. Sometimes we have lawyer fees to pay. And we need your donations so that we can continue to bring you the other side of the story. Well, I'm with James Bradbury. He lives in the Caledonia area. You might rem recall uh, James, we met him, I think, back in May, and it was about the um, PPE issue with one of the long-term care facilities in this neighborhood. But of course, if you're talking Caledonia, you are talking problems with certain elements of the native community. Uh, for years, decades perhaps, uh, there have been all kinds of land dispute claims going on here. I think it was about 10 years ago, Christy Blatchford, mm -hmm. the late Christy Blatchford wrote a bestseller called Helpless about what it was like to live in Caledonia. And <clears throat> James, I, I can't help but notice uh, Argyle Street, which we're standing on right now, just um, a little adjacent to the Canadian Tire here. It is closed off. Uh, I see several OPP officers and OPP cruisers. About um, 150 meters further, I see it looks like some derelict cars and a motorhome and several tires, uh, which is making a, an additional blockade. I assume that's a NATO blockade. What exactly right now in August of 2020, what is the issue here in Caledonia? The main issue is uh, the government's lack of resolving the situation. Um, in my personal opinion, the natives actually, I'm, because I'm not anti-native in any way, I actually believe that they do have a legitimate claim to some of this land. The problem is, is that uh, the government hasn't resolved it. And so every time the, uh, the OPP comes in, they kick them out, they come back with a vengeance for the next uh, protest. And this has been ongoing since 2006, these protests, and they've only been getting worse and worse and worse. And now we're starting to see armored cars. It's just, it's not getting any better. We need resolution from our government and not just local government, like provincial and federal. When it's technically supposed to be federal, it's supposed to be handling this. I know it can get very complicated when we deal with native land mm -hmm. issues, James, but at the, the root of the matter here is it that some in the native community are saying that they have ownership of land, land that I understand is about to be developed. Yeah. So the Six Nations, uh, the, in particular, the hereditary chiefs in that, uh, they do claim uh, the ownership. And there is uh, paperwork with the uh, Haldeman track uh, that shows that this was theirs. Um, unfortunately, due to mishandling and whatnot, it did wind up in the hands of private citizens away from the uh, reserve. The thing is, is that the government was supposed to pay them for that. Now, like I say, the government we're talking about the Ontario government right now, or, no, no, or talking about federal government. A federal government. So actually, back when we're talking about this, this is the crown, okay. right? You know, we're going back far enough, right? Um, the thing is, is that you know we understand that that's how that needs to be resolved. They need to get paid for this land. Okay. Now the developer did try to pay them, to be fair, but he tried to pay the band council not the hereditary chiefs. And he did try to reach out to the hereditary chiefs, but you know, nothing happened, unfortunately. But at the end of the day, the government needs to step in and resolve the entire Haldeman track. And that needs to be finished. And then to make it all worse, I mean, this is already a complicated situation. Then you get extremists from outside. Then you get extremists from like Toronto and that coming in here and saying, yeah, all white people need to leave. 
And by extremists, I think you told me off camera, you have seen busloads of Antifa from the greater Toronto area coming here to, uh, I guess, really stir the pot. And uh, it seems to me from what you were telling me, they're not really interested in any kind of negotiated settlement. They just want anarchy and violence. A small percentage of them are native and actually know the history and the debate that's going on right now in this area and genuinely want what's good for the native people. And and then you have a large percentage who are basically anarchists. They're uh, coming from Kitchener, Toronto, uh, Brantford, and they're only coming here to cause trouble. It's unfortunate. Now, speaking of violence, James, there has been some acts of arson of yes. late, hasn't there? Yes. Now, officially, it is not uh, linked to this, but uh, Mark Hill um, did condemn and Mark Hill is who? Mark Hill is the elected band uh, council chief. So he, um, the hereditary chiefs don't acknowledge the band council because it was uh, imposed by the white man, right? So he denounced these protests as a native person, denounced it, and his house was burned the next day. I mean, there is the police. There were people in the house at the time, wasn't there? Yeah, his, uh, from what I understand, his parents were in the house. Um, it's it's um, very unfortunate. Um, and from eyewitnesses that I've talked to, they have saw this happening. They saw it was arson. It was intentional. Um, and But we've also heard stories where other locals who um, have spoken out on camera, and this is one of the things that even I'm concerned about, that I want to make sure I'm representing uh, in a balanced fashion, is that other locals who have spoken out have been attacked in the past, and who have had uh, vandalism and have been targeted. James, let's talk about the rule of law here. I mean, what they're doing on this uh, road has to be illegal, I'm sure. And yet it's kind of like uh, New Day, same story here in Caledonia. You have law enforcement out here en masse, but they're not enforcing the law. And I'm trying to understand why that is. We actually have a court order right now to clear that. And uh, I don't want violence. Uh, that's the last thing anyone wants on both sides. I've been talking to both sides. Violence is not the answer. But these blockades, especially with COVID, this is like strangleholding our community. It's killing us. And I mean, there, there are so many communities that now have to do this huge detour to get around. And there are so many businesses and homes over there that are struggling. I don't know if you can see it, but there's uh, some houses. And those houses are actually behind the uh, barricade and are basically behind in uncontrolled area. So- um, And how are they treated? These are non-natives that live basically in disputed areas. They, <laughs> I don't want to speak for them uh, because I obviously don't live over there, but um, as long as, uh, you know, obviously nothing's, you know, happening, you know, they're left for the most part alone. They're allowed to travel back and forth. But when you have tense situations with police moving in and um, uh, fire and emergency not being able to respond to you. So like, for example, when this whole thing started out this, this year, uh, fire trucks responded to a f uh, fire down there and just booked it down there. They've started pelting them with rocks. Oh, really? Now, that's the natives said. Yes. Now, again, I can't stress this enough. The natives are not, not all natives are violent. Okay. The, this is obviously a few radicals that you know, decided to take their anger out on the truck. And that's not appropriate. These were people responding to an emergency. But when you're a resident back there and you know fire trucks can't get to you, like, how does that make you feel? One of the complicating factors, perhaps, uh, folks, is that the conservative MP for this riding, Diane Finley, she announced she is not going to stand for re-election, uh, something that might happen as soon as uh, spring 2021. And in stepping down, uh, the veteran MP had this to say about the situation. It comes down to law enforcement. Everybody has the right to protest, but not to disrupt the lives of others. Our laws in Canada are set by Parliament according to the values of the society. People who choose to live within that society are obliged to follow the law. So I think that is a common sense take, uh, but it stands to, um, I, I guess only time is going to tell whether law enforcement will indeed uh, enact the law of the land, because as it stands now, uh, that is certainly not the case here in Caledonia.
Well, folks, we're now on McKenzie Road in Caledonia, and um, this is a development called McKenzie Meadows, or it's supposed to be a development. You can see that the um, land has been surveyed for the roads, and this is where houses would be going up, but alas, it is occupied by natives. You can see tents everywhere. And um, actually, just as we came here, there were a couple of people tearing down the billboard uh, here, announcing the Mackenzie Meadows development, which is uh, owned by the developer uh, Foxworthy. And that's the thing, this is indeed private property. It has the green light for development, uh, but no development is gonna happen anytime soon by the likes of it. It looks like uh, the natives are here uh, to assert uh, their claims that this is disputed land. And we are indeed trying to negotiate to have someone uh, come on camera for an interview, but it doesn't seem to be going that well so far, but we'll give it the old college try. Well, unfortunately, folks, I was very hopeful of speaking to some of the uh, squatters here at uh, Mackenzie Meadows. Um, initially, they said someone was going to come on camera, uh, but we have a little bit of a crowd here that has uh, very firmly said that they're not interested and they want us to uh, leave, uh, even though this uh, area of land that we're on is not the disputed um, territory at all. What about you ladies? Would any of you like to come on camera or? Uh... And uh, I don't see any point in staying here, so we shall be on our way. Well, darkness is starting to take lease here in Caledonia. And you know, for several years, since 2006, there has been a lot of darkness here. It seems these land disputes, these the, the turmoil, the violence, the arson, it just, it's a never ending cycle in Caledonia. And it's funny folks, I referred to Christy Blatchford's book, Helpless. And here's a passage from that uh, book. Caledonia is the story of innocent victims who have been abandoned, left helpless. It is the story of a government that has not governed and police who have not policed. It is the story of a community whose freedom and peace of mind have been sacrificed in order to maintain a toxic status quo and keep officials in the jobs they are refusing to do. And you know, folks, those words were published in 2010. It is now a decade later. And really, when it comes to Caledonia, has anything really changed? For Rebel News, I'm David the Menzoid Menzies. Folks, you know we do everything we can to bring you the other side of the story. We had three trained security personnel come along with us to Caledonia, and I think there was a moment there where we were really happy that they were with us. Uh, things were starting to get hostile near the encampment. There is a cost to this, so I am asking you once again, if you are able to, please make a donation 
to journalistdefensefund.com. That's journalistdefensefund.com. I know these are terrible times in which to ask for a donation, but we are doing everything we can to bring you the other side of the story. And sometimes that means employing security personnel. Sometimes it means employing lawyers, but we want to continue to bring you that other side.